Florida has this name, this nickname of the fishing capital of the world, and there's a lot of good reasons to that. Number one, this annual economic impact associated with recreational and commercial fishing exceeds $7.6 billion. From saltwater fishing licenses alone, sold by FWC, over a million and a half dollars just for recreational fishing licenses. That doesn't count the commercial. Between recreational and commercial fisheries, we have more than 100,000 jobs that are supported in our state. And then, part of the reason why I'm sure you guys like to fish, this is the hub for a lot of local as well as national fish production, fish and shellfish production. And so 90 million pounds of seafood is commercially landed here, and that of that, 84% of that is supplied throughout the United States, including grouper, stone crabs, spiny lobster, and others. And so for a lot of reasons, especially for the economic ones that I just mentioned, keeping the fisheries afloat and viable and sustainable is a very high priority in Florida. And as such, we have a lot of very well thought out, based on science, fisheries manage, uh, fisheries regulations. So there are a lot of different interests when it comes to fishing, recreationally, commercially, We've got a lot of tourists who come here and will buy saltwater licenses for their stay. And so, because of all this, that's what goes into the factors of seasonality, bag limits, size limits, etc. And by default, that creates the need for catch and release fishing. And so where does this come into problem? I'm sure you all have probably experienced it. I've seen it when I'm out on the boat. You'll watch people fish, you'll see the fish go thrown back, and it won't go back to the bottom. So there are a lot of problems that are associated with catch and release that sometimes people, despite best intentions, may not be aware of. So, number one, not all fish survive that release. And we'll talk specifically about one of the major causes of that shortly. They could end up exhausted after their fight on the line before they're ending up back to the boat. They also may then become more susceptible to predation if they're not able to submerge and get themselves back down to death. Fight, or excuse me, the fight times matter. The longer that fish is fighting, the longer time it's out of water. Like I said, especially when it comes to the fish being out of water, that's less available oxygen for it to breathe. So if it's already losing that ability, it's becoming exhausted, it's not gonna be able to breathe, and process oxygen through its gills once it gets back in the water. Improper handling can lead to damage to internal organs or its muscular or skeletal structure. So these fish could be then suffering injuries from the way that they were handled once they were landed. Depending on how the fish was handled, they have that coating of slime, which I'm sure you're familiar. The removal of that slime can also lead to the fish's reduced ability to fight off parasites and infections. So that's another thing to be sure of, which is why we promote use of bare hands when handling fish. And then lastly, hook-related injuries can also prove lethal to fish. If the fish is improperly hooked, it can get gut hooked or gill hooked, leading to its mortality, even if it is released. So there are a lot of different ways to try and minimize some of the impacts when it comes to catch and release fishing. First things first is being familiar with the current regulations before you even head out. FWC releases their regulations twice a year in hard copy and electronic format, but also, and they look something like that, and they're usually available in English and in Spanish. And in addition to FWC, there is the Fish Rules app. Does anyone here use it? Yeah, just, no, yes? I got one. Uh, just curious. Yeah. We'll talk, okay, we'll talk about that one. I'm just curious, because I've heard a lot of, I've heard mixed feedback. Okay. Just yeah. No wrong answer, guys, I'm not gonna tell on you. Okay, so there's the Fish Rules app, which is an available smartphone app. However, of course, that relies upon the fact that one has a phone, the phone works, the phone has battery, and a signal. So, 
Same position as the bottom. Right, especially if you're going out of flamingo. Yeah, yeah swing shot. Yeah. So there, there are different approaches. Use the fish rules or your paper copy. That's step one. Step two is making sure that you have the right tools for what you want to do. In addition to your rod and reel, your hook and your lure, making sure you have other tools like pliers. This can be helpful for removing hooks if you don't have a dehooker. Dehookers, anyone here use a dehooking device? Yes, prefer with catfish. Totally <laughs> prefer. Don't leave them without it. There are a couple different models. They make it much easier to remove the hook. And I mean, I can tell there's some of you guys who probably don't like the slimy feel, but it also avoids your having to make contact and hold the fish in your hands if you don't want to. And keeps the catfish out of your leg. And keeps the catfish <laughs> out of your leg, says Herman. Pro tip. The next is the use of circle hooks. The circle hook is really, really important. And the circle hook is excellent for fishing because of the way that it is shaped, the way that the shank is turned, minimizes the possibility that that hook could be swallowed by the fish. It also improves the chances that the fish will be hooked in its lip rather than elsewhere. Also, if you're using and targeting larger, it doesn't, no, it doesn't work. Larger species, it's nice to have something to handle them when on the boat, either a lip grip or a net to help catch the fish to make it easier to handle. And to reduce it's your opportunity for dropping it onto the deck because you're trying to reduce the actual physical injury to the fish. And then lastly, barrel trauma mitigation tools, which is the main highlight of why I'm here today. So some of these things are probably a general set of best practices that have been developed through experiments, through research. And so when it comes to catching, Number one, targeting openings, the open species, and fishing in shallower waters if possible. Of course, that's largely dependent on what you are targeting. Try to limit the fight time and choose the right tackle for the right species that you're targeting. And then coming back to the corrosive non-stainless steel hooks. Does anyone know why we say non-stainless versus stainless? So they rust out of the fish eventually. So they'll rust out of the fish. So if you have to get rid of that fish and it has the hook, if you have a stainless hook, that fish is gonna have that lip jewelry probably for the rest of its life. But if it's a non-stainless hook, that, that hook will rust out and then the fish can continue living its best life once it's been released. I heard a little chuckle, I'll take it. When it comes to releasing, keeping your hands wet, not using gloves so that way you're keeping that slimy coating intact on the body of the fish. That's important for its, its immunity, its defense system. Use of a dehooking device to remove the hook. And it's that little guy with the blue handle in the upper corner. And then when it comes to targeting those deeper water, reef fish, snapper grouper complex, mitigating for barrow trauma. And of course, when you're dealing with the fish on the boat, trying to minimize that handling time, the amount of time the fish is out of the water, getting the fish back into the water and to the bottom as quickly as possible. What is barotrauma? Barotrauma is a pressure-related injury. I think this is a really cool photograph, not photograph, it's more of an, it's an x-ray, and showing this fish with barotrauma. So does anyone know what we're looking at right here, that dark black shadow that's showing up in the image? Yeah, it is a gas bubble. Oh, now we have it up. All of a sudden. Yeah, that's, that's trapped gas in its swim bladder. And so when you're dealing with depth offshore, usually in water that is deeper than 30 feet, when you bring up a fish, you know that gas bladder, the fish have it so that it's able to regulate its position in different depths in the water column. So when you bring in that fish and it comes up from depth, that gas bladder expands. And that's what ends up happening. And so that expansion of gas, this may look familiar to some of you. When we're looking for barrel trauma, we're looking for those external signs. This is what happens when the swim bladder expands. It will often push the stomach through the mouth. You'll get also the, the innards protruding through the anus. 
bubbly scales, that Popeye, as well as fish that are just unable to swim back down on their own. Last summer, I was off of Key Largo with my dive buddy right off the Binwood, and there was a big tourist fishing boat, and there was a queen angel fish floating at the surface. And maybe they were a little further, but it floated in, and I saw it, and I went, ah! I didn't have any of the tools, so we actually freed over and swam it back to the bottom. And as soon as it got back to the bottom, it was gone. So I like to think that I save a life. So that was a, an adapted way of descending the fish, which I'll come back to in a second. So when it comes to barotrauma, there are ways to mitigate for it to increase that fish's chances for survival. The two common ways are venting and descending. And I do want to mention that when it comes to descending, if you're fishing offshore in federal waters on the Atlantic side, you are required to have a descending device on board and readily available. Okay, not breaking news either. Okay, so venting involves use of a hollow needle with a very, very sharp hollow needle. And when you vent, you are poking, you're making a physical hole in the fish to puncture that swim bladder and vent the air that is bubbled up. Descending involves a weighted assist back to the bottom. There are a couple of different approaches, including descending devices or weighted milk crates. Now there are, there are pros and cons to both. Personally, venting is not an option for me because some of you heard me say that if I eat, I make a mess. I don't do sharp objects or open flame. So using a needle to try and, mm -mm, it's, for me that wouldn't work. The pros to venting is that it's fast, it's pretty cheap, it's one small tool, it's relatively inexpensive to keep in your tackle box. And if it's done correctly, it can work. I like this graphic. I know it's probably a little tough to see, so I will describe. In this first column here, you've got the fisherman. It has caught this cool grouper down here at 120 feet. And as it comes up, it starts showing signs of barotrauma. And you can see at the top here, it's got the stomach protruding through the mouth. If the fish is vented, Yes, that gas might be gone, but that fish has still become stressed and is responsible for making its way back to the bottom on its own, where either it may just be too exhausted or might get predated on. Versus descending, you've got that fish that's showing the signs of barotrauma, and the descending device has been attached to the lip, you attach it to your rod and reel, and it's triggered to release when it reaches a certain depth, a certain pressure. So as it's going down, those barotrauma signs have become mitigated, and once it reaches depth, it doesn't have to do any work and it's able to go and swim on its way. It's less risky for the person. It's non-invasive to the fish in all the different ways. So now I want to transition into what some of these techniques look like in real life. This was a case study on gag grouper that my colleague, Dr. Angela Collins, did over on the Gulf Coast a few years ago. Now, gag grouper, especially on the Gulf Coast, is a huge target species, both commercially and recreationally. And they're found in a pretty expansive range. They're here as well, but I mean, it's my understanding, it's not the same kind of target here for gag as this for, say, red and black. Those adult fish, are found on both naturally occurring reefs as well as artificial reefs. And just like a lot of other snapper and grouper species, they spend their juvenile and formative years in estuaries, mangroves, estuaries, and seagrass beds before they move offshore. And they're also protagonists from aphrodites, which means they start out life as female, and then once they become large enough, they change sexes and become male usually around two feet total length for the females, and then the males get to be a reproductive age when they're a little over three feet total length. And similarly with the other saltwater regulations information, economic information I talked about, this is another big business for this particular fishery. Commercial landings are about one and a half million pounds per year in Florida. And those recreational landings are about 3 million pounds per year, so it's huge. Very, very highly regulated. 
And when it comes to estimating the stock assessments, that has been really challenging because it's been hard to estimate the mortality associated with catch and release of this species. So they are regulated by their quota, their size and bag limits, as well as seasonal and spatial closures. Oh, and here's what I wanted to show. So the previous estimates of the release mortality for recreational fishing was anywhere from 10 to 40% mortality after catch and release, and greater than 60% for commercial fishing. So this study is super duper cool. Here we've got the Gulf Coast, the Tampa Bay, and Pinellas and Hillsborough County area. And Angela and her team acoustically tagged about 100 gag grouper across different depths. They were tagged with two different, two different trackers, one a regular fish tag, the second was an acoustic hanger. And so these were across depths from 30 to about 150 feet. And as you can see by the dots on the map, this requires a lot more travel. They have to go out a lot further into the Gulf to get to that depth, you know, 30, 40, 60 miles versus what we have here. We can hit it in 10. <laughs> so this was a project that was a cooperative effort between the research team and local recreational anglers. So the researchers went out with the anglers, the anglers caught, the researchers tagged and took their data. So these fish were fitted with that external tag, the regular fish ID tag, and that acoustic hanger. And in addition to measuring the tag, weighing, excuse me, measuring the fish, weighing the fish, photographing, these fish were also, those that showed signs of barotrauma were received that bar barotrauma mitigation treatment whether it was venting or descending. They tried to do one of each depending on the depth, so that way it was a pretty even span. And what's really nifty about the pinger is that it sends a signal every minute and a half. And that signal tells where that fish is, not just geographically, but also depth in the water column. So pretty cool. It gives you a good sense of fine scale data as well as how and where they're moving. What about if a shark eats you? Well, and shark's they can only, <laughs> you know, I didn't ask. They didn't mention that. I think they would probably, as long, they were probably tracking the fish as long as they were receiving a signal. So either if they stopped receiving a signal, maybe it was because it was predated upon by a shark or someone else caught it and just didn't release it or it didn't survive. So you can see most of these fish were sent back with weighted descent, or the ones that were descended were using weighted descent, no milk crates. From the data that were gathered, these box and whisker plots, they freak me out a little bit, but the thing that I want you to focus on is that here you've got the intensity of barotrauma, so starting from zero, ratcheting up to the worst, versus death. And so the big takeaway here is in that red circle, you can see that the deeper the depth, the worse the barotrauma. So there's, that's really hard to, it's really hard to argue that. We know that depth means greater risk. And so what this study showed was that the best practices employed with venting or descending that they work. And so what's really cool is of those 100-ish fish, 93% resumed normal movement within two days after their release. And then 90% of them stayed on site after their release and proved survival for at least two weeks. But wait, there's more. The life of these tags is about a year. The battery life on the tags and the acoustic tags is about a year. So for data nerds like Angela, and she will not be mad that I said that, this is what she calls data gravy, because even after their study had officially concluded, they were able to keep tracking the movements of the fish that still had working tags. And so bonus data, and so what they found were that 25%, so a quarter of the tagged fish were recaptured by their own team, 
or reported by private anglers who also recaptured them. That's amazing. It's, it's really neat. And that the majority of the recaptures happened at the same site of where they were originally caught in tash. <laughs> and there were nine recaptures at distances up to 116 kilometers from the original site. So nine of those fish decided to take a more substantial tour of the Gulf after they got their next lease on life. And so this is a cool map, and I'm going to refer specifically to the notes to make sure I don't misrepresent any of these. So the first, this first fish that just popped up on the map, this fish was tagged in 2014. It stayed on site for seven months and then moved quickly. It traveled three miles in about three hours. Two days later, it was 11 miles away from that original site. Now the next fish, right up here, a little bit further offshore, this fish stayed in place for about seven months following its recapture. Then it left the acoustic array, so it left where all the acoustic receivers were that could pick up its signal. And then it traveled, was then caught commercially two years later, almost 70 miles away. I got that. I see a couple smiles. So really, really cool. Best practices, we love them. And so as such, these best practices have been incorporated into a couple of statewide programs that have been created and administered by Florida Sea Grant UF, FWC, and other partners. One of them is the Florida Fishing, Florida Friendly Fishing Guide Certification. That's a mouthful. And it's past my bedtime, so bear with me. This is a certification course, it's entirely online, that goes into a lot more depth. It mentions everything that I've touched upon, but it goes a lot more into local ecology, best practices for catch and release, as well as fisheries management. It is a voluntary course. It's been extremely well received in the, fishing, the charter fishing community around the state. And completion of the course gets these charter captains a listing as a Florida friendly fishing guide on the Florida Sea Grant website. And not only do they get that, we, as with everything we have to do as extension agents, we have to evaluate. We ask for the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the evaluations, the immediate course evaluations, and the follow-up ones that we've sent have been overwhelmingly positive. And we've had brand new fishing charters as well as those who are a little more seasoned take this course. From there, there's also been a smaller, shorter spin-off that's geared towards the recreational fisher called the Florida Friendly Angler Course. This is a class that I have been promoting. It's a self-paced electronic, it takes about two hours. You can do some of it, leave, come back, and highlighting a lot of the same things, but it's condensed. It's free. I will include that link, and I will challenge you, because you know, we, we know everything. I know everything about diving. But I like to think there are still things that I can learn. I challenge you to take it and give me feedback. Let me know what you think. I've been piloting this. I've been promoting it. I've been down at Homestead Bayfront quite a bit over the summer, intercepting politely fishers coming back at the end of the day, giving them materials. And I've had a few of them complete the course and come back to me. And it's been really, it's been really gratifying to hear what they've thought. The biggest hurdle seems to be getting to the registration page, so I'm trying to figure out how to make that better. Likewise, on the Gulf Coast, this is specific over on the west coast of Florida, there's a similar program called Return of Red. And that was funded specifically to promote the use of descending devices. I think it was funded by BP money that's still in the mix somehow, that provides a similar education course and anglers receive a free descending device upon completion. So if you all know people on the Gulf Coast that think this might be interesting, please feel free to share it. It's my goal to give descending devices to people who take Florida Friendly Angler. I'm still trying to figure out how to make that happen. But I will tell you, if you take the course, the Florida Friendly Angler course, I will send you a freebie hooker. I'm, I'm good for it. Ask Herman. There are tons of other resources if you're interested in any similar projects that we've talked about. I'm working with Angela right now on a project targeting that's looking at Goliath grouper. 
catch and release. And so we're doing something similar. We're working with local guides, targeting who target Goliath to bring them up, tag them, and mitigate from barrow trauma, and also see what some of those techniques may look at, look like for that fish that's so much larger. And that's gonna be especially important with the change by FWC that will come into effect this coming year. Can we eat the glass? I would no. not. Very high mercury content. No, so, hey, just once, I mean, one time, right? Uh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> you, you read the fine print, Herman. Read the fine print. You don't want to. Trust me. And so the last thing I want to leave you all with is that these are all things that are really important to keep our fisheries healthy and productive moving into the future. Everyone likes to mention they want their kids, their grandkids, their grandkids' kids to fish, and this is one way that we can actively be a part of that legacy now. And I love being able to speak with all of you because like I said, I, I'm i talking, but you all are out there on a regular basis doing that. So I definitely would like to hear if you've had experiences mitigating with barrow trauma, what that's been like, and both bad and good. And if I can help, I'm here for it. And I do want to give a shout out to Angela because she just knows it all and she does all the cool things so they actually went out i couldn't go in september but they went and did a goliath grouper fishing trip on the gulf coast and i was unfortunately out of town so i'm hoping to get on the next one they do and it's a little more common in the gulf i've only found two two over here that specifically target one up in palm beach and one out of monroe so we'll see if i can go out with them and so that concludes the formal part of the program and I want to thank you all for listening and I, please I welcome questions.